Well, welcome to the second Big Bang workshop of the 2023-2024 school year. Um, as you may know, attending these workshops is a really fantastic way to prepare for the Big Bang business competition, as well as the Little Bang pitch and poster competition. Um, and I'm Julie Ambalou. I'm a new program manager at the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I'm going to be the lead on the Big Bang and Little Bang competitions. So I'm going to go ahead and put my email address in the chat right now. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions after this workshop. And I am going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker tonight, Professor Andrew Hargadon. Um, and I'm going to introduce him in a little bit, but Andrew is going to give a presentation. And then after, if um, we have time, I'm going to go through a slide deck with more information about the business competitions, as well as some um, deadlines that you're going to want to look out for. So, Professor, thank you for being here tonight. It's so wonderful to have you. Um, Professor Andrew Hargadon is the Charles J. Soderquist Chair in Entrepreneurship and a Professor of Technology Management at the Graduate School of Management. He is a Faculty Director and Founding Director of the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Professor Hargadon is also founder of the Center for Entrepreneurship um, and the Energy Efficiency Center at UC Davis. His research focuses on the effective management of innovation and entrepreneurship, particularly in the development and commercialization of sustainable technologies. He is the author of the books, How Breakthroughs Happen, The Surprising Truth About How Companies Innovate, which I'm reading right now, and it's fascinating. I recommend it to everybody. Um, especially anyone interested in participating in these competitions. And the book, Sustainable Innovation, Building Your Company's Capacity to Change the World. Professor Hargadon earned his PhD from Stanford University's School of Engineering and his BS and MS in Stanford University's Mechanical Engineering Department. So thank you again for being here and volunteering your time. I'll go ahead and let you take it away from here. Thanks, Ryan. All right, so I think um, we're recording this for posterity, for, for re, yeah, okay, perfect. Yes. So uh, welcome, and it's uh, it's great to have you here. Um, what I wanna talk about today is essentially getting started. How do you start to think about your business uh, and particularly your sort of your business plan for the new uh, year's Big Bang business competition? Um, so what I want to do is cover a couple things, but primarily I want to get you thinking about the most effective things to do early on in terms of, of making a leap. And largely that has to do with uh, deciding if and when and how to make that leap. So the way we're going to talk about this is um, we'll talk about how to move forward with your idea, um, but particularly we'll talk about how to think about your venture, uh, what you're moving forward with as an experiment. And what that means is you're not only coming up with the vision of what your venture would be, but also attempting the early stages of validating that vision, demonstrating to yourself and to others that there is a there there, that the idea you've got, the company that could be formed from it uh, works or could work. And so we'll talk a little bit uh, in that way about how to move that forward effectively. Um, and in particular, talking about your first $5 experiment, which will make sense a little bit more as we get moving. Um, and then we'll uh, uh, practice applying what you learned. We'll actually set you up to go and, and practice applying what you learned from that. Also, with that in mind, um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, where we are in the process, where you are in the process of, of thinking about a business. And so what this slide shows is, in fact, um, a number of different ways of thinking about your business and, and its uh, early stages of getting started. In most cases for a company, what they'll be doing is, is actually uh, starting out with coming up with an idea. And this, that's, this is the gray area. And in the university, oftentimes that's funded by research grants and it's conducting basic research or it's funded by more development grants, more focused on commercializing work, but still funding uh, uh, research. At, a, at that point, um, now you sort of step into, if you decide to go forward with an idea, you step into the same 
a situation that people outside might step into in starting a company, people outside of a university, which is you've got an idea, how do you get it started? And so if you look at the top side of this of this chart uh, on the of the text up, up here, what you see are the stages of funding. Um, so as I said, in the gray area, if you're in a university, often that funding is coming from government agencies and others giving you research grants. But once you decide to start your own business, you're now starting to take on your own money. And the earliest stages of that venture funding come from friends and family and founders, or otherwise known as friends, family, and fools. Uh, and it's it's generally a small amount of money. It's enough to pay your rent or enough to keep you, you know, in, in ramen uh, until you can demonstrate your idea is is viable enough to get a larger investment. And so we're talking about the range of $5,000 to $50,000. And like I said, it often comes from a rich uh, aunt or uncle who's been in the business before, or done, you know, done something and, and is happy to invest back in, in your ideas. From there, you move into angel investors that are giving you 50 to 500,000 or, or now almost a million. And then early stage venture capital, which will take on a larger investments, like a million dollars to two to three or four in the early stage. And then you have different venture capital firms that are more later stage that will put in anywhere from two to 50 to now these days around you know up to hundreds of millions of dollars before um, you move on. And so rather than talk about that too much, I just want to talk about it in terms of as you go forward with an idea, what often happens is you're seeking out just enough funding to get a little further along for somebody else to step in, see and feel confident about the idea and step in and provide more funding, additional funding, and, and grow the amount of funding as you go forward. Um, what that corresponds to is on the bottom side, sort of the stages of your venture development. In the beginning, you're trying to prove the concept, you're trying to prove there's a market there and that they're responding accordingly, that they actually like what you have to offer them. And then when you think about it some more, then you've got, once you get that early funding, you can start to build bigger prototypes, working prototypes, you can start to gather a team around you. And then you move on to building then engineering prototypes and you start making contracts with suppliers to buy uh, the equipment you need or the parts you need. And then you're moving into production prototypes and on and on uh, until you get to the point where you introduce a product at scale and you start to grow. Now, what the blue line shows is, is really important to know, which is there's this, this notion of net cash flow, which is really a very simple notion. It means you have more money coming into your bank account any given month than you have going out. So the idea behind this is to recognize that while you're sort of in a university lab or something, you're getting this grant money, you have more money coming in than going out and it feels pretty good. But as soon as you start a company, now you're starting to borrow money from friends or then to take investment. And since you're not making any money, most of that investment is putting you deeper and deeper into debt of some kind. Now, if it's equity, it's not really debt so much. If somebody's giving you money as an investor, they're buying a part of the company. So it's not really like you're going into debt there, but what you are doing is giving up parts of your company to continue uh, growing it in hopes that the the slice you end up with of that pie is much bigger than it was at the start. Now, the reason this blue line is, is often infamous is because of something called the valley of death. And the notion behind the valley of death is that you, uh, you've you built up a company, you've acquired investors, You first you've gone through friends and family, then you've got angel investors. You've acquired a number of investors and you're growing bigger and bigger. And so your budget is more and more. Uh, but at a certain point, you fail to get that next investor. You fail to get the prototype done in time. You run out of money. And the idea behind that is that at that point, that's where most startups fail. And they fail. It's called the valley of death for that reason. They fail because um, they can't go any further. They can't get any investment. You know, they, they, haven't, they can't finish the product that they've been working on. So that's the valley of death. Now, one of the most important things I can say about the valley of death is, is something that my wife taught me, which as a doctor she is, um, which is there was a problem 30 years or so ago with tracking the number of deaths from diseases in uh, particularly in developing countries where you had a lot of different healthcare systems in play. Because oftentimes the leading causes of death in the world were uh, cardiac arrest and respiratory failure. 
and I know this is a tangent, but bear with me. Cardiac arrest is, is where your heart stops beating. Respiratory failure is where you stop breathing. And as my wife gently pointed out to me, uh, those aren't causes of death, those are symptoms of death. And, and so what you see often in the Valley of Death is companies that fail to continue, they fail to get new funding, they fail to finish their products. And as a result, they run out of money. But running out of money is a symptom of a venture failing, not the cause of it. And so what I really wanna stress with this side, slide is in fact that we need to think past that to uh, now looking at the yellow slide, the number of new ventures that are formed and recognize that there is in the very beginning of any venture, a cliff of commitment, which is the decision you make whether or not you should go forward with this idea. And if you make that decision out of passion and say, well, this is a wonderful idea, I love it, I'm quitting my day job, I'm dropping out of school, I'm, you know, and I'm gonna convince my family to, to put their house in debt, you know, in second mortgage in order to fund my, my wonderful idea, without really checking to make sure uh, it's gonna work, then you, you're, you're making a, a very dangerous commitment. At the same time, if you don't, if you worry about like, man, I don't want to take it on. It couldn't, you know, it could fail. It could, it could derail me. Um, but you don't check to see whether it's actually possible. And so again, running the, those tests to see to validate whether you've got a good idea, you might in fact not pursue it at all. And so the problem with commitment isn't just over committing to a failing course of action, but it's also failing to commit to a good opportunity. Now I could tell you all of the horror stories uh, having grown up in the Silicon Valley of friends of mine who failed to join that startup that became Salesforce. You know, failed to join the, you know, because they didn't, they wanted to start their own company and they didn't want to take a, you know, a smaller job and a bigger or, or a greater opportunity as often as the ones who failed uh, by starting a company that wasn't going to succeed. So with that in mind, I want to, what we're going to talk about in many ways is kind of where this, let's see if I can get this, where companies fail, how they fail, and how we can think about that and actually test our own ideas based on this knowledge. So most of the reasons why companies fail tend to be avoidable. They also tend to be baked in often early on. So the top 10 reasons that, that startups fail, this was an analysis of all of the companies, 100, 100 startups in one year uh, that they did some intensive postmortems on. Uh, the biggest uh, the biggest failure was no market need. Now, it's often a shame that they got that far uh, starting a company, taking on investors before they realized that nobody wanted the product that they were developing. That's often something that can be easily tested. Ran out of cash. That's actually the valley of death. That is the symptom of death, not the, the cause of it. Not the right team. Again, something that we'll talk about can be over the course of the, of the Big Bang something that can be figured out early on. Now, uh, let's see, get out competed. That's oftentimes uh, simply another, again, matter of, of who is the competition and whether you're doing pursuing it in the same fashion as they are. Pricing and cost issues, poor product, all of these symptoms or all of these causes are actually things that you can find out before you've spent too much money or time developing your ideas and your venture. So that's what we want to talk about today is how do you get that right start? How do you check, you know, how do you ask the right questions? How do you run the right experiments early to avoid a lot of that? So when we talk then about the life cycle, there's a couple of different ways of thinking about it. And in this, what we want to talk about are the stages you go through. And in our case, one of the first stages is, you know, this sort of generation one of your company. This is the first three to nine months of getting started. You may not even incorporate yet, but it's the three to nine months that you're going to spend trying to figure out whether this is a good idea and whether you should pursue it. And in that case, what we'll talk about are the things you can do during that time. Like for example, uh, primarily in this early stage, you're managing mainly for uncertainty and commitment. What that means is you're managing to figure out whether what you're doing is actually gonna work, whether there are customers who will respond to your value proposition, to your promise, that the product will work in the field, that you can uh, build the business around it and, and scale it with a sales group and all of these, all of these questions you might have about the actual venture. 
from there, the next step is to manage uh, yeah, for your product and process development. And, and we're not really going to talk about that moment because we're not here to get there. We're here first off to just get you through the, this first uncertainty and, val and commitment. But it's, you know, the next stage would be managing for market and product and process development. The stage after that is, is now once you've developed the product and a process is building the company up. And then after that is managing the growth of that company. And oftentimes, if you're successful, you'll have figured out a way to hire other people who will do that for you. But uh, but that's the way the cycles go. And again, to remember that we're just focusing on that first stage, generation one, deciding whether or not to pursue a venture. So the first rule of deciding whether or not to, to pursue a venture is that moving forward requires you to embrace uncertainty. And, and here's where it's really important to understand what uncertainty means and what I mean by embrace it. So uncertainty is, uh, is a form of risk, but it's very different from what you often think of as risk. Risk is the kind of thing like um, going up to Tahoe, going into casino and putting all of your money on, on, on black on the roulette table. And you've got a 48% chance of winning. There's actually, and then, you know, red's got a 48% chance and the house has got a 4% chance, but that's uncertain. That's risk. There's, there's odds to that. They're the same, regardless of who shows up at that roulette table. And there's a return that, you know, and there's a rule, you know, how the game is played. Uncertainty on the other hand is, is not, it is not knowing the odds. It's not even necessarily knowing the game. Uh, and it, you know, if somebody else could show up, uh, you know, right before you or right after you and have very different uh, odds in game and not knowing the rules of that game. So what it really means in terms of uncertainty is often that you just you don't know whether going right or left is going to be better for you. Uh, let me put it in a, in a better way. The military has something called uh, they call it decision inertia, which is if you're a soldier, if you're a firefighter, if you're a policeman. And you're put into a situation where you're unsure of, of either option or any option you have. And you're not sure that any option is, you know, you're choosing between. Andy, you're muted somehow. Am I unmuted now? That was weird. Okay, so um, so on, uh, the military looked at this because oftentimes what will happen is a, a soldier, a firefighter, a policeman will find themselves into a difficult situation. They don't know what's going on. They don't know how many people are in the house that's on fire, or they don't know whether the house is the structure is remaining intact. Uh, on a battlefield, they don't know whether the enemy has seen them, and they don't know where the enemy is. And so, when you're faced with these kinds of situations of uncertainty, the human instinct, which is often very much like the animal instinct, is to actually freeze, is to avoid doing anything until you get more information. Now, the reason I say this is the same as the animal instinct is because they've done a lot of experiments around uncertainty with animals. Mice, you put a mouse on a table, a field mouse, and then you release the smell of uh, on a table with, with grasses and leaves and a, sort of a, a natural environment, and you release the scent of a cat, and the mouse will freeze, not because uh, they, you know, well, primarily because they don't know where that cat is. They don't know whether the cat's seen them. They don't know if they start to run, whether they're running towards the cat or away. And, and they do know though, that if they do run, they may in fact remind the cat or let the cat know that they're there. So they've done this for cats. They've done this for, or for um, mice. They've done this for uh, dogs. They've done this Back in the 50s, they did it for undergrads. You could put people in situations of uncertainty and measure their responses. And people tend to freeze. So why this is so important for you as an entrepreneur is because your actions are going to be shaped by the amount of uncertainty you see in the environment. And as you learn more and more about what's uncertain, you're often going to have the tendency to freeze, to stop doing the things that make you uncertain. And how does that manifest? It means that if you're a programmer, and you have uncertainty about the market, about the customers, or about uh, um, resuppliers or distributors that, that, or, or, or resellers of your product, 
those are all uncertainties, whereas programming is something you know. So you'll avoid talking to customers. You'll avoid testing the idea with, with resellers or with, a, with others, with part, potential partners, and you will spend most of your time programming. I mean, as a mechanical engineer, I would do the same thing. You spend most of your time engineering because that's what you know, and you avoid all of those other areas which are uncertain. So moving forward in this way means it's most important to embrace your uncertainties to recognize them as uncertainties and to know that there are ways to move forward that are less than uh, as paralyzing as you might think. If we get this, yeah. So the way to think about recognizing and, and reducing your uncertainties is it's all about moving from inaction to action. That's the primary thing you can do. And so from this perspective, the steps are, you know, you have a vision for a company you have a lot of assumptions that you're making uh, to see that vision is successful, but uh, some of those assumptions carry a lot of uncertainty. Are there customers who would actually want this? Would they pay enough for this? Are there suppliers who can give you a deal on the, on the materials you would need? Or can you actually accomplish this technically? And so your challenge is to recognize the assumptions behind that vision and then recognize of those assumptions, which ones really make you nervous, which ones are uncertain to you. And recognizing those uncertainties means essentially embracing them. It's not that you love them and you wanna keep them around for a long time, it's that you accept them as big uncertainties that are gonna change the way you do the business. And once you've accepted those and acknowledged those uncertainties, you can now start to think about ways to run experiments that reduce because while you can't reduce risk proper, the notion and you can't you can't change the odds on a roulette table, you can take an uncertain situation and make it more certain. That's the wonderful thing about uncertainty. While it's paralyzing, uh, if you actually acknowledge it and focus on it, you can start to think about the ways in which you can get out of it by running experiments. So the very simplest thing you can do, the mantra that works, uh, and I've done this, I've seen so many people do this, uh, in helping start new companies is to step back and say, you know, for this venture to work, for this thing to work, what of our assumptions need to be true? In other words, what has to work if this venture is going to work? Customers are going to have to be willing to pay $50 for this product, or customers are going to have to be willing to, you know, or customers are going to have to see the value proposition. Uh, the technology is going to have to cost under X dollars to produce. You know, you're going to have a number of these uncertainties and you're going to want to try and figure out what of these assumptions that, that are underlying the venture are going to have to work. Those become then, you know, the, 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 the experiments that you can run. So another way to look at that is your challenge of starting this company uh, is going to involve two things thinking about the venture, trying to imagine what it's going to be like, thinking about the assumptions underlying that, you know, are you going to sell it uh, through online uh, advertising? Are you going to sell it with salespeople? Are you selling to companies? Are you selling to individuals? Do they care? What's the value proposition? You're going to come up with a lot of, you know, a lot of that's going to be your vision. And in fact, your ultimately your, your assumptions about it. But then you're going to do the experiments that tell you whether those visions are right, whether those assumptions are right. And you're not gonna do it once. It's not all at once. You're actually gonna cycle through this. It's, it's RPMs, revolutions per minute or per month or whatever you wanna call it. The number of times you can go through this cycle of thinking about your idea, coming up with the assumptions, coming up with the experiments, running the experiments. The number of times you can do that is gonna determine how well you do. So it's what's your vision and then will it work? And how can I test that, you know, that, that, that it will work? Now, an important uh, a caveat to this whole thing is when you're thinking about these assumptions, when you're thinking about your business, it's going to be absolutely essential that you're specifically wrong rather than vaguely right. What I mean by that is you can't say, I think customers will like this product. You're going to have to say, I think, uh, you know, uh, Mechanical engineers in developing uh, computer-aided design projects are going to recognize the value of this product in achieving this goal. You have to be you have to be 
specific enough that you can't just say, well, I guess those customers didn't like it, but I still think some customers will like it. So better to be specifically wrong when you frame your assumption, when you start to think about what is going to have to be true in your company, you're going to have to be very specific about it. The more vaguely right you are, the more it sounds comforting, but the the more you'll be able to dodge around actually testing the idea and testing it effectively. So better to be specifically right. In, in this case, in our talk, it's about better to be specifically wrong about your assumptions than vaguely right. If anybody has a question on that one, uh, throw, throw it in the chat because this is a really important point. So I don't want anybody to miss it. But as we get into things like elevator pitches or, or, or questions you're asking of your team or of your investors or of your, of your suppliers, that ability to become very specific is the only way you can really test whether your assumptions are right. Which gets us then to the notion of a new venture as really just this series of experiments going through the think do cycle. Yeah, I've got a, I got a question, right? It looks like there is a question. Right. So Ying has asked some, or yeah. has asked, sometimes what I notice is that big companies can conduct market research to reduce risk and look for market need. How do individuals do something similar and conduct experiments? Great. Yeah. Big companies have very large processes for doing this and very large budgets for doing this. And oftentimes that's uh, that's two things. One of which is it makes them the dinosaur uh, that a, venture, a new venture as a little squirrel or a mammal can scurry around quickly. Um, so while big companies do it, they do do this in a, in a very particular way that's, that brings their own uh, challenges. Um, so they call it. They might call it market research if they're looking at a market. And what they might do is a focus group. They develop a product that they think um, that they think high school kids would like. This I'm bringing up a very specific example that in fact led to some of this work. Uh, and they and then they'll bring together. So so they'll decide that this is a, an interesting or potentially interesting product with a potentially large market. Then they'll call a focus group, which really means they hire a consulting group to come in and run a, an interview of the you know, the likely users of this product, the target target customers. So in this particular case, uh, for example, it's a company that made the floor decals for Walmart, among other grocery, among other sort of major big box retail stores. And there, you know, these floor decals have specials. You know, there's a special on aisle nine you know, um, frozen goods this way. And they'd have them all, and they'd be essentially large decals that would stick on the floor and survive a million footsteps. So they were incredibly rugged. And what they realized was they could use those uh, on, the, on, the, on essentially snowboards where you could upload a picture to the website, download, they would send you this new snowboard skin, which would be a decal for your snowboard of you and your friends at, you know, at Whistler, last weekend so that you could be sure and brag to everybody else, uh, you know, this weekend that you were up there. But they were thinking about skateboards and snowboards as a way, you know, and, and these decals as a way to personalize these boards and, and personalize them over and over again as you saw fit. And what they did was they did exactly that, that, that market research. And they hired a focus group and they spent uh, uh, a focus group consulting firm and they brought in, they ran a focus group study it cost them $50,000, and it turned out that they didn't have the ability to print these decals out for the kids, so they used the largest other stickers they had, which fit into an inkjet printer, which were CD labels. Those are round, you know, the, the round labels that you could put, you know, print and put on a CD. And it turns out that the kids didn't think that was all that exciting, you know, that, to print a, an inkjet picture on a CD label. And at that point, they had spent $50,000 and the response they got from the kids was that they weren't convinced that they didn't see the value in this. And that was enough to kill the idea in the big company because they'd spent $50,000 already and they weren't going to lose any more money after that uh, uh, chasing the idea. So the challenge with a new venture is, is actually also the opportunity. You don't have $50,000 to spend on a focus group. You might have $5 to spend or let's say $50 to spend. And so I was working with them, but I was gone for that. And when I came back, I pointed out 
that they could have taken $50, bought pizza for the local high school ski club, run the exact same experiment with an inkjet printer and CD labels, realize that the experiment was wrong and pretend they didn't do anything. Just, you know, sort of bury the receipt, bury the $50 expense and live to fight another day. If they had done a $50 experiment instead of a $50,000 experiment, they could have learned so much about what they were doing and what they were thinking and their market, but avoid being, being essentially taken out of the business by having lost so much money at the beginning. I hope that makes sense. There's a lot of companies that do this, but the large companies do this in a very different way. As a startup, your challenge is to figure out those low cost ways to design these experiments. So let's talk about that. Let's try and figure out how to how to explore your assumptions and, and, and uncertainties. Now, an important way to think about it is to actually parse them out a little bit to structure your, you know, the way you create or, or search for these uncertainties. You know, the, the technological ones, is it feasible? Will it work? Will it work at a cost? You know, can we build something that actually works? Uh, is the market uh, interested in it? Is our product that we develop actually desirable to a particular market? And then from a business perspective, if the technology works and the market wants it, can we build a business that sells it to the, you know, builds it and sells it to the market at affordable prices and profitable uh, revenue? And your venture has to sit in those three. It has to sort of find that wonderful overlap, the, the, the Venn overlap between these. And so your challenge, of course, is to figure out what are the uncertainties about each of these aspects, the technology, the market, and the business that you can test and demonstrate to yourself that it's worth pursuing and then demonstrate to investors that it's worth investing in. Because again, it's not just asking for this to work what has to be true, but what has to be true to who? Of all the people that are gonna be involved in your idea, how do you convince co-founders that this is a good idea, something worth doing? How do you convince your family uh, you know, but if you're married, how do you convince your family to take a second mortgage or you know, that you're going to quit your job for a month or six months or eight, you know, a, a year and see if this is a going business to investors who are willing to put their cash in to mentors who are willing to give their time to you to customers, suppliers, employees, all of these people are going to have their own uncertainties. So it's not just yours, but those uncertainties that you're going to need to answer for too. So now we're back to this sort of think do and how do you manage that venture process? The whole point of your early stages of a new venture are to identify and resolve these critical uncertainties and to do it as cheaply and quickly as possible. And what that means, it brings us to our mantra here, the 55500 mantra, which is never do the $50,000 experiment until you've done the $5,000 experiment. Never do the $5,000 experiment until you've done at least one $500 experiment. Never do that till you've done the 50 and never do that till you've done a whole bunch of $5 experiments. So what's a $5 experiment? Buying somebody a cup, of, you know, buying, finding somebody in the industry, buying them a cup of coffee and asking them, do you think this is a good idea? What am I missing? Finding a mentor who, who's invested in or founded other companies in this space or other companies elsewhere and saying, what am I missing here? I think this is a good idea. And then as you get more and more feedback, you can start to up your investment. What's the $50 experiment you might pursue? But it's really important, again, to, to think of it in stages. What's the least amount of cost you can spend to buy down the most uncertainty you can? Reduce the most uncertainty with the least time, energy, and money invested. And that's the best way you can move your venture forward because those are the things that are limited. The time, the energy, and the money are, are the things you have limits on. And, and the most uncertainty you can reduce with, with what you've got is a limited budget. So the way to move that forward rationally, to step back and think about it, is to set early stage deliverables. What do we want to do first? What do we want to do in the next month? What do we want to do in the next three months? Now, a way we have to do that is, and this is not something you would actually show on a pitch deck, but it is something you would need to have thought through before an investor will take it seriously and take your, uh, your opportunity seriously, is what are those assumptions? What are those uncertainties that you have? 
how can you now? Now, in this case, I, this is an assumption. So it's a hypothesis. If you have an assumption, if you have, you know, I I think that I think snowboarders will pay fifteen dollars for a new skin with the, you know, that is a custom picture that they down that they uploaded onto the internet and arrives in the mail three days later. I think they will pay fifty dollars or fifteen dollars. That's my assumption, but it's also my hypothesis because I've stated it in a way that it can be disproven. All we need to do is is ask ten, uh, you know, ten or twenty uh, people whether they would do this, and if they say no, I'm not spending fifteen bucks for that, then we failed. Or I might say that you know, five out of every ten people will say yes. But either way, if we structure the hypothesis right, we can prove it right or wrong. And then we can take that and use it to design the experiments we'll run for $5, for $50, and then on up from there. But particularly what we do with that is we start to think about what do we wanna do first? What do we wanna do in the next month? Before we quit our jobs on the nights and weekends, what can we do that's for $5 gonna give us a whole lot of feedback? Now we had some students who came through our program earlier and they had an idea for a, they were actually indigenous drinks uh, that were bottled and, you know, made and bottled, but they were indigenous drinks to, uh, to the African continent, but all across the African continent that uh, incredibly flavorful um, and not present in the U S and they had the idea of, of packaging these drinks and selling them. And what's the $5 experiment they came up with it was actually to create them, take them to farmer's market and offer a taste test. It didn't cost the customer anything, but they got quick responses from people about whether they, you know, what they liked, what they didn't like, but it was overwhelmingly positive. And so eventually what they ended up doing was then coming back and selling four varieties of them to see which of those varieties was popular you know, a couple of weeks later, and then coming back after that and, and having an actual product in stock that they could sell at farmer's market to see whether they could go, you know, whether this business could grow itself. But they didn't do that at the very beginning. They started very much with a quick taste test, a direct feedback loop that gave them for $5, essentially, good feedback that the idea was worth pursuing a little bit more. So thinking about those early stage deliverables, you want to list the, your, your assumptions and then figure out what can I do to test those assumptions for $5. Uh, and the reason these color are, are color coded is because what you want to plan out is that you'll do these gold ones first. Then when you've got those answered, you'll go ask your, you know, your rich aunt for, for money for this, or you'll go ask, you know, you'll, 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 you'll decide to take out that savings account or, or cash in whatever bond you, your, your grandparents gave you before and spend some more money to go to the next level. But you're not going to do that until you've proven these, you've run these experiments and they've proven you're still on the right track. So thinking about it then in this way, you're actually doing exactly what a venture capitalist would do, which is give you a little money to get you to the next level with the belief that if you do the right experiments with that money, you'll be worth a lot more than you were at the beginning. Their stake in you will be worth a lot more. And we can, you know, and together with them, you can go out and raise another round, a much larger round of investment after that. And it's 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 called tranched investing because what you're doing is you're laying down one, uh, you know, one amount of money to get through this level of uncertainties, with the belief that you can now prove that you're worth getting another level of money to get through the next set of uncertainties. And again, we're talking here about that. That's your first generation trying to prove it out. What are the you know what does that include? Which brings us to your pitch, your pitch, your elevator pitch, as we'll talk about, is really your first and easiest $5 experiment. And when I say easy, it's, you know, it doesn't fall in your lap, but it's really easy to work on. Uh, it's really easy to fix. It's really easy to iterate and, uh, and, it, and it doesn't cost much to produce. So let's talk about that. Um, your elevator pitch is, is how you describe what you're doing. In the $5 version of it, your, your pitch is, is sort of, what do you do for who and why is it valuable? And we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk more about each of these in, in general. 
The next one you're gonna do, and this is also part of the Big Bang structure, is when you've got what you think is a pretty good elevator pitch, you've got a starting point for conversations around your idea, you can use it to, to talk to people, customers, you can use it to talk to investors, you can use it to talk to others in an industry. It is the shortest, quickest way to get your point across. Uh, and as as we'll you know, as I'll say later, most entrepreneurs have three or four elevator pitches, depending on whether it's for an investor, a customer, or others, but they're all variations on a particular theme. And I grant guarantee you, any entrepreneur who's been at their business for a, a, even a few months. Uh, if you shook them awake at two in the morning, they would be able to tell you their elevator pitch. It's there, it's rehearsed, it's very clear and crisp, and it gets across exactly what they have in a very short amount of time. What we'll also do, though, th th throughout the Big Bang is actually provide a second tool called the, a business canvas or a, sort of an outline of your business, which allows you to lay out all of the different elements of the business, the technology, the market, the value proposition, you know, what is your solution? What is the problem you're you're trying to solve? Uh, and then talk, we'll talk about the revenue model and the milestones and teams. It is a way of very quickly on one page, sketching out different facets of your business. And it will serve as the foundation for the final sort of pitch idea, you know, way of pitching your idea, which is sort of the, the more $500 in the, in the sense that you're gonna be working on this for a fair amount of time is the 10 slide pitch deck which lays out most of the angles or the, you know, the, 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 the aspects of your business that are going to be relevant to an investor. It's not because you're necessarily going for investment money, but, but that's a very proven model for getting you to think about all of the different aspects or sides of your business. And it's a fairly comprehensive prototype then as a result. It means you've really tested most of the ways in which this could go wrong and hopefully figured out ways to resolve those, those uncertainties, or at least knock them down a, a notch to make them more believable and more trustworthy, I should say. So, uh, so let's start with the elevator pitch. Yeah, it's got its name from essentially, you know, you're in Hollywood, you're in a building with, uh, you know, with the, looking for an agent or somebody to rep your new screenplay. And then you get in the elevator and it's heading down to the first floor and in steps George Lucas. And, and he says, so what, do you, what brings you here? And you have 30 seconds to say something. This could be the biggest break of your life. How do you describe your movie? And every screenwriter, if they're going to have a, you know, that, that kind of, that they're, they're going to risk the elevator moment they're going to have a 30 second pitch. They're going to have a way of describing their movie in 30 seconds. And so that ported over really nicely to new ventures because you're, you know, you're at an, a, a technology event, you're at an industry event, you're at a, a, you know, at a big bang event and along comes an advisor or an investor and they say, so what are you working on? What's your 30 second pitch? What can you give in that moment that allows them to, to capture your, or to understand what you're doing and immediately, hopefully ask, oh, that's really interesting. Tell me more about X. So in definition, it's a brief and simple statement that describes your idea in order to define and test the vision. We'll talk about how it tests it. Quickly and clearly communicate what you're doing and generate questions and engagement. Um, as far as the define and test part goes, I just wanna come back and underline that. That's what I mean by better to be specifically wrong than vaguely right. If you can't be very specific about who your customer is, what your problem is that you're solving, what their problem is that you're solving and what your solution is, then you're not ready yet. So the elevator pitch is a really good first test of how clearly you understand what it is you're providing. And don't worry, every entrepreneur goes through many iterations in order to develop the understanding and the pitch that they've got. So most importantly for you, it's the first and easiest way to prototype your business model. It allows you to express, test, cycle this idea, like think about your, your initial vision, share it in an elevator pitch, listen to the feedback. A quick aside there, because I have to say it, the elevator pitch is not a sales pitch. You're not trying to convince somebody to buy it. You're trying to describe what it is you're doing because you don't know whether they're a customer, an investor, a competitor, 
You're simply trying to describe what you're doing in clear language, develop that, share it, and then listen for the feedback. Do people nod? Do people look up, look down, look away, try and figure out, look confused? That's okay. That's feedback. You can work on it and come back. But oftentimes, and particularly with friends and family, you can try it out and actually iterate on it and start to listen for the feedback and start to fill out a little bit more, uh, be more specific about it. So what we've learned over the years with this is that the target delivery is like under 30 seconds and under 60 words. You have 30 seconds and then otherwise you're gonna start losing people. 60 words is even probably the max for a quick elevator pitch. But what you're trying to do is summarize and simplify it. Drive to the essence of your product, your project, your business. Don't, don't get into too many details, just say exactly what it is you do and then wait for them to respond with questions and let them lead the conversation forward. Make it easy to understand. You know, it's the lay person that you're trying to, 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 to target. No jargon. You know, if your grandmother was at the Thanksgiving table, you know, would they get it? That's the ideal. And then of course you can adjust based on the audience. If, you know, if you're among, if you're among engineer, fellow engineers, they're gonna wanna know more about the technology, you can adjust accordingly. But if you have that basic initial pitch, that's gonna be the most important thing. Uh, and again, uh, you know, our, our belief, and it's proven out so many times, if you can't say what you're doing in 30 seconds or less, you don't yet know what it is you're doing. And so you're not getting to an unnecessary simplification. You're actually getting to the heart of what you do. And that's the most important thing. So just as some examples, again, going back to our framework, you know, what do you do? Uh, well, we X for Y, that Z. We, you know, this is our offering. We build this, or we, and I'll give you the example in a second. Four, and this is our customer, and that, and it solves their particular need, whatever, and that's that, the value proposition. It's the problem they have that we solve in a particularly beneficial way. So here's an example from a company that came through a couple of years ago. Their original idea, it was only 17 seconds, but it says, we offer a software platform with a proprietary monitoring algorithm that helps professional service companies proactively manage their client billing. This delivers 30% shorter payment cycles and an average increase of 200,000 in cash on hand for each of 100,000 firms nationwide. Now, if you actually have the time to read it, it makes a pretty good sense. But most people get lost pretty quickly with a software platform with a proprietary monitoring algorithm that helps them. So ultimately, and, and this was in, the, in, a, you know, in, a, in a few, like 10 minutes, Working it down, it's we host billing software for small professional service firms that reduces their payment cycles by 30% and improves their cash on hand by 200,000. A very clear distinction, what do they do? They host billing software for, you know, for who? For professional service firms. Now I know what they do and what the target market is. And the value proposition, it reduces their payment cycles by 30%, which means their, pay, their customers pay 30% faster. And that gives them cash on hand of more than 200,000 than they had before. Simply by closing the loop on the payment cycles that much faster. And they can demonstrate that return. So this is an elevator pitch, which clarifies to them and to anybody they talk to what they do, which is hosting the software, for who? Small professional service firms. So if somebody comes along that's a that's a store or you know a retail store or something, that's not who they're interested in. They're interested in service firms. They know how to target them, they know how to advertise to them, they know their problems. And then exactly what they bring to the table. Reduce payment cycles and improve cash on hand. So that's an answer, that's a way of thinking about your elevator pitch as a prototype, as you Vote, verbalize it, you can start to think, okay, what's complicated here? You can talk to people about it and ask them what, what makes sense, what doesn't. And as you work with them, you get down to, again, that essence of the elevator pitch. So, we what, for who, and then why. 
Now, I just want to, um, so if anybody has any questions on this, this is also a you know, perfectly good time to do it. You may be afraid, but what if I tell my competitor this is exactly what I'm doing? You know, what if I meet them on the elevator and I give them my elevator pitch? Well, it's not clear necessarily because you haven't described the how you do it. But oftentimes, if you can't patent it anyway, um, it might be better off to find out early on that somebody else is also in this space. Uh, but particularly, I think the most important thing to think about with worrying about sharing ideas with your competitors is if they can take your idea and get it to market sooner than you can, then it was probably going to happen regardless of when they found out about it. Because that means they're moving faster. Um, oftentimes, what will uh, also happen is um, that you're going to figure out quickly that this space is crowded. You're going to figure out quickly that, that what you're, by getting this out, well, by not holding it inside, not by, by not sharing it, you're going to learn less about your idea and its opportunities because you're not going to be able to get feedback from more people. So the risk that your idea will be stolen is actually offset by the damage you're doing to your learning. The elevator pitch is out there as a test. It's a test to get feedback from as many people as possible. Oh, have you tried this? Or have you looked at that? Or have you talked to so-and-so? So many opportunities come from sharing your idea with others relative to the possibility that they might take them and run with them. So remember, though, with the elevator pitch, better to be specifically wrong than vaguely right. Every bit of feedback you get is going to come because you were specific about something. That feedback might be, oh, that sounds right on, or that feedback might be, I happen to, you know, I happen to be one of those professional service firms and I don't see the value in it. But the more specific you are, the quicker you will get to good or bad feedback and the better able you are then to respond to it. Uh, so uh, we have any time for questions on this? We do have time. We're we're um, at five fifty five right now. Yeah, and I so so I, before I go through the the other the other materials, I just want to see if there's any questions on on recognizing your uncertainties, on verbalizing them, sort of articulating them, turning them into experiments you can run, uh, and then particularly the elevator pitch is the first one. We're all good. I have a quick Hi. question. Yeah. Oh, here's another one Go from forward. Ying. How how do you determine what feedback is valuable? <laughs> um, well, okay, so we're going to talk about a number of these things in other in other workshops. But first off, listen to it. You know, don't resist it, and um, and think. Okay, so you know, what perspective are they coming? You know, where are they coming from? What perspective and experience do they have? Uh, how how seriously should I take this? It, you know, never, never avoid feedback. Um, any feedback is valuable, but it'll either tell you that this person has a lot more knowledge than I do in this particular area and it's really worth listening to, or I don't think they're, they're you know, I don't think they know as much as I do. So I need to figure out a way to change my pitch or to change my, you know, so that it becomes clear that, I, that this is not the problem that they might think it is. But However it is, recognize that these people are sort of like your first customers. They're listening to your idea. And if they don't get it, or if they give you, you know, challenging feedback, uh, it's on you to figure out how to overcome that, how to better prepare them in the introduction or, or change your language to make it something that's more easily understood, or to recognize that they do know more and, and maybe you should adopt or adapt uh, your, your ideas as a result. If that's the case, then, you know, Here's your next $5 experiment. Buy them coffee and try and get a better understanding of why they believe that's the, the case. I hope that helps, but trust me, every bit of feedback is really valuable. And one of the worst things you could do is demonstrate as an entrepreneur that you think you know more than everybody. Now, it's you know, as an entrepreneur, you should know more than everybody about your narrow, narrow slice, uh, you know, your venture and its market and its technology. But that doesn't mean you should come across as, as believing that. You should come across as trying to test every bit of feedback and see what's valuable about it. Get the most out of it. We're good? Happy to have any more questions. 
Okay, so let's move along then uh, to thinking about uh, oops, some other pieces of this uh, that, that we can do. So um, There's I talk about question. like worrying. Yeah. One more question. Could you take one more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, how, do you pick, how do you pick a team that helps you reach your goals? <laughs> Okay, that's another that's another presentation we will have as well about how do you build a team. Um, most of that's going to come down to um, honestly, particularly in the early stages, that you know that slide we had with the list of of assumptions that we've made and hypotheses and experiments that we need to run. What you want to do is think about the kinds of people who can help you run those experiments. Do you have the engineering talent? Do you have the scientific talent? Do you have the marketing, the people who can go talk to customers and try and figure out what you're trying to build on a team is not people like you, but people who do the things that you can't do on that list. Uh, and so that's a very simple answer to this question. A broader answer will be in a later workshop where we talk about how do you build a team around your ideas? How do you think about the milestones that, that you're gonna work on and Particularly, how do you find those people? Get, ah, wonderful, thank you. Networking and team formation coming up. So you're talking about just a, a team for the Big Bang or because I'm talking about a team sort of more generally in terms of starting a venture. But that's, um, I, I will say that one of the first things you wanna think about with your team is actually not the team itself, but the sort of the team of mentors or advisors that you can find that can help you think about your idea without taking part in the business yet. They, you know, hopefully you can find people who have experience in the industry, et cetera. Okay. So in that one, yeah. So for the big bang competition, we'll have the, the networking team formation for just a general question about it. I think personally, I think the first people you should build into a team, if even if informally and, and don't tell them they're part of that, are, are, are people who are willing to spend time giving you advice because they've been there before, whether that's starting a company or been in the field you're going into. And, and because they will be invaluable in helping you figure out what kind of a team you need next, what kind of things you need to do next, what are your next milestones? Hopefully that helps. And then we'll move now to a um, couple, couple of various things. So first off, um, we'll also talk, we have a, 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 an attorney coming in for intellectual property. I believe at some point during this competition, but one of the things to think about is your intellectual property, your your patentable property. Um, that is the that's the one thing that you should sort of treat as confidential. You should be able to have a conversation about your idea without giving up what is patentable. Um, so you want to carefully guard that. But this is a, this is sort of a dangerous the, the sort of the double edged slide here because. If you guard it too much, you won't find out that other people have already done it or that other things are going on that are displacing it or changing it. But at the same time, you don't want to give away something that you, you realize is going to be the core value of the company in a patent. If it's not patentable, though, then, then honestly, it's going to be, unless you've got the, you know, the recipe for Coke and you Coca-Cola and you plan to keep it in the family for the next 150 years uh, under lock and key, um, most of the ideas you have are going to be things that you'll get that will get better when you talk about them. So one of the biggest challenges there here is is really thinking about do you have defensible intellectual property, something that you could patent and protect? And if you do, then then think about uh, the lawyers and think about getting uh, in touch with a, a law firm or a patent attorney who can help you think about whether this is a, a truly a a patentable idea. Um, I think we I think we'd talk about this more in, in a later workshop, but do know that um, this is dangerous because if you immediately start talking to people and say, well, I need you to sign a confidential disclosure, most people won't because they don't know yet what you're going to tell them. And they may already know things like this and don't want to be privy to something that they don't want to, that, that they don't want to appear to have stolen when they already knew it. So a lot of challenges associated with this um, as we get into um, uh, 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 some of the, the, the attorneys and the attorney, the, the, the legal advice that we'll discuss, know that this is something that you want to take more attention and, and spend time talking to an expert about. Um, Non-confident, so introducing your company, you know, 
Well, this is, okay, let me skip this. There we go. That's what I was hoping to get to. This is our canvas. This is, this again, that quick sketch way of thinking about all of the different aspects of your business. What's the technology? What are the key activities associated with it? Who are the customers? Who's the market? And, and so we'll be filling this out as we go forward in the workshops, but it's a way of helping you think about all of the different aspects. How do I make money? What's it going to cost me? And what's it going to, you know, what are the revenues? What's it going to pay me in terms of a business? How do I get, how do I get paid? And, and what do I pay out to do that? What milestones do I have? What team do I have? What resources? And it's a way of getting it all out on one slide. Um, that's the one slide thing that we talked about before. The next one is the pitch deck, the 10 slide deck. And that's really your first comprehensive prototype. So it should be created, shared, treated as a work in progress. It is, as I said, yeah, a prototype. And the slides are an easier way to do it than a long written out business plan. Um, nobody, in fact, really wants to see these, you know, the long written business plans anymore. So the slides are really a very nice way to capture it. These are based on, um, with a couple of venture capital firms we worked with, this is based on sort of their own, their, their sort of slide deck recommendations as well. Um, so it's critical to use the slide deck to describe the, you know, the, all the aspects of the business and you know, both as a prototype and as a way to communicate. Um, but presenting it, recognize that presenting the business requires going in a particular order, like providing the right information in the right order so that you don't raise questions. You start to give them a framework of what you do and then get more and more detailed as you go forward. And again, you know, when you're thinking about the path forward with this, this pitch deck, what you're trying to address is the question, like, what would have to be true for this to work? And how do I get the audience or somebody on the other side of this deck to recognize what has to be true and what is true to get this to work? So some slide template guidelines, you know, uh, we have the, the, the actual PowerPoint deck. You can use it. You can download it and use it to, as your uh, you know, original template. Use it to define your venture, hone your pitch, answer questions about you know to investors uh, preemptively. Sort of recognize these are the questions people ask. How do I get them into the slide, and get them in the order that they'll ask them? Again, the goal is to be able to quickly communicate, uh, you know, to your audience, but also to yourself. Be concise, but try and be you know be comprehensive. This is always a challenge, and then use graphics and images when you can, not as decorations but only when it really helps to, to visualize your message. Uh, two decks, there tend to be. One is a talking presentation. This is what you might present to the big bank judges. This is my, you know, might present to an investor. And then a leave behind deck that's often annotated that has more of the details. If you're making claims about the science, it also has the bibliography of papers published around it. Or if you have made claims about a patent, it also has uh, um, you know, the, the progress of the patent or the law firm you're working with for the patent. So know that you know there's information that you want to put in the slide deck, but then when they ask for you to leave a copy or, or you're given the opportunity to, that's where you can put in more information than a slide deck uh, would have. But when in doubt, you know, go for the simple, the clear, and the concise in the slide deck itself. So what's it made of? Title page, introduction. We'll go through all of these very, very quickly uh, in hopes that it, it gets you a, a sense. Your title page, your company, name and contact information. Uh, these days, it's really easy, right? You can have whatever name you want, as long as you can get an email address for it and a website for it. Uh, include all your names and contact information for the, for the whole team. And include the company website if you've got one set up. Here's another place for your elevator pitch. Describe what the company does. And you can also briefly mention what you've accomplished so far. So we're making, you know, we make, we're, we host billing software for small professional firms. Um, we, you know, we're already working with 20 firms uh, who are beta testing our, our product right now. And, you know, and we have X, uh, X amount of money invested in, in, in to do this. You know, let them know where you are uh, in terms of your, the, what you've done so far. So it's not just that you're, you know, this is what you're going to do, but here's, here's how much we've done so far. The problem, solution, value proposition, this is where you very clearly sort of expand on your elevator pitch. This is the problem our customers have. These are the customers that, who have it. 
you know, this is the solution we provide and here's how we think they will measure the value of that solution. The target market is again, clearly identifying where you find these people, who are the customers, how will you reach them? How will they pay? Um, you know, how much will they pay and, and how many will, you know, will they buy? Any kind of elements you can do about that. And then also, again, be honest, here are the competitors serving these customers today. That will actually make you look better because what competitors demonstrate is that there is a market for what you're doing. It's just not being well served yet. If there, if you ever said there are no competitors for our product, what you're really saying is nobody has yet had to, you know, cared to make any money selling this to these customers, which actually raises a lot of concerns among investors. So on the technology side, think about what it is, what it does, how do you describe what you're doing, you know, the what how what you're delivering as a technology or as a solution actually works. Um, and then describe any patents you might have around it or provisional patents or trade secrets that you can't talk about, but but know that they're, you know, you're going to depend on that to be defending your ability to do this and prevent others from it. Uh, and, and think about, again, what distinguishes the value of your technology from what's out there already. Um, don't think that you need to get too complex. If you're an engineer or a scientist, don't think that you need to get into the weeds here. Uh, on your second meeting with a VC, they might bring in an expert in your field, and that's the point at which you might get down into the weeds of, of the science or the engineering. You'd be ready to talk about it, but you don't need to put in the technology slide all of the complications you know, that, that involve your own engineering talent. Um, as far as revenue and pricing goes, describe essentially how you're going to make money. What are, you know, how, how much will you make? How much will it cost to make this? In other words, how much will it cost to deliver the technology or to, to, to develop the product and deliver it? Um, how much will you, again, you sell it for? You've talked about that. Bring that down from the earlier slide. Uh, and when do you think you can have this business up and running? So oftentimes, uh, you know, it's a sort of a three to five year projection you might have. You know, in the first year, we think we're going to be, we're still developing it. We should in, you know, within 18 months have a prototype in the market and have X number of customers who are going to pay for it or not. By year three, we think we'll have this kind of revenue. We'll be selling this kind of, and, and talk about your expectations for how you grow the actual business itself in terms of the financial side of it, the revenue side. And that becomes then these sort of projections of, of what you've got and when you'll start to make money. So one thing about these financial projections is that you don't want them to be detailed sort of um, Excel spreadsheets. What you really want to do is get across the engine, the, the sort of the financial engine that will make the business work. So what you've got are a couple drivers of revenue, the number of customers you have, the number of units per customer, and then the price per unit. You think that, you know, in this particular slide, what that would tell me is that you think that this is, the, you know, this is, these are the key drivers of your revenue. So if you're going to, you know, this is how you'll grow, you know, well, this is how you think customers will grow, to which point I would then start to ask, well, how are you going to grow them? How do you know that, you know, what's your approach? How are you going to reach these customers and convince them? You know, how, so now you've got customers moving from five units uh, to, to 20 units over time. Why are, you know, why are you going to get customers to, to be buying more units? I'm going to be able to get into your business and you're going to be able to talk about it more effectively over the slide in terms of how we think that you're, you know, how you think you're going to grow your business and attract more customers and charge more money or it'll charge less. And, and whether that's going to look like a viable business, you know, and it's, so you're, you're here to sort of tell me how you've got an angle on your company and, and, and its growth that others might not have, or that you think is, is, is going to be effective. The same thing on the expense side is, well, if you're going to grow that fast, how are you going to do it? Is it going to take as many people to grow? Whoops. As it, or, you know, as, is it going to take as many people to grow as, as you make more money? So you're, you're going to sort of break even continually, or are you going to make increasingly larger amounts of money going forward? And as you can see here, I've even, you know, there's, there's, there's losses moving forward 
over time in the thousands. Like this is, you know, we're going to lose a lot of money. We're going to lose even a lot more money as we grow, but eventually we're going to break even in year three and a half and year for year four and start to make more money. So that's where we talk about how you think the, the business is going to work itself. And then you're kind of sort of finish it off with, you know, with milestones. What, what are you doing? You know, what are the things that, that you're going to be doing next? If I gave you money for this, if I invested in this pitch, what would you do with that money? You know, and it's so it's sort of connected to are you going to hire more people on the team? You know, it should it should jive with all of the other uh, preceding slides. But are you going to complete the technical prototype? Are you going to file for IP? Are you going to secure a key partner, getting a first customer? What you know, what are those things that you're going to do in the next nine to twelve months that make me feel like okay, if I put my money in and you accomplish these things? I can now imagine how much more you'll be worth at the end of that and how much might, you know, might my money be worth or might, you know, how much better will be, we be able to attract a next level of investors. Then you talk about the team, who do you have to actually do accomplish those milestones? You know, your managers, your, 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 the management of the team, and then also the advisors you've brought in. Like, are there, are there key advisors you've got who are leaders in the field whether that's the technology side or the market side, who have had experiences building companies like this before, have had experience with this product as a customer. So list that management and, and the advisors who are involved, describe your current one, but also think about the one, you, know, you feel free to list the people that are going to be hired once, you know, once you've got that. Like it's me and my co-founder, but with your investment, we plan to hire a chief of marketing, you know, a head of marketing right now, next, or we're going to, you know, we're going to hire that programmer next to build out our team. Describe your advisors. And then for each of the founders and advisors, describe what makes them special, what makes them relevant to the venture. Why are they here? Lastly, you know, summarize, articulate what it is you're planning to do, and then talk about what you're going to do next. Basically tell them what you told them. And that sets you up then with the you know sort of a finish uh, of your slide. You may have options if you, depending on what you're doing, but you can describe things like a, you know the use case or the typical customer. If you want to dive into details that people keep asking you about, like well, you say professional service firms, but are they any particular ones, or is there a particular kind of service firm? And you can say, well, we focus on small, you know, small to medium sized law firms. And here's why, you know, this is the, this is the typical scenario that a, of a use case. And that's why it fits so well with law firms, or we focus on, you know, um, accounting firms. And so, so you can start to, you know, have optional slides developed that answer questions that people will ask, um, but you don't necessarily pull them out yet. And that's, Let's see if I can get back. Yeah. So that's that's the the essentially the 10 slide deck plus some extras. Should you want to do that? But I'd wait until you get questions on your slides before you start to develop the extra slides. All right. And that's now we're at the end. Um, but we have more questions, hopefully. Anybody have questions? I'm here all week. Try the deal. So then I'm going to get out of this. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Julianne, do you want to go ahead and? Oh, yeah. Julianne, you've got stuff yeah. to do, right? Let me go ahead and share. Um, I'm going to share some uh, slide deck with more information about the upcoming competitions. So let's see. Um, I don't know, Nikki, it's not. Go on. I can't share. The, um, you should have sharing privileges. It looks like it's not letting me, um, take anything from my desktop. All right, hold on. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to run, but uh, if anybody has any questions, hopefully I have my contact information in there. Mm -hmm. um, feel free to reach out. Great. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Take care. Okay. So let me go ahead and see how I can play this. And then go to slideshow. There we go. And from the beginning. Okay. So for those of you who are on, if you haven't um, already created an account with Startup Tree, you want it, but you're interested in either participating in Little Bang or Big Bang or um, staying up to date on the Institute's upcoming events, such as like future workshops, the best thing that you can do is, is have a Startup Tree account. So you can start by going to this um, website and creating your account. And then there are just so much that the Institute does happens through Startup Tree. So you'll also have the opportunity <clears throat> to meet um, potential partners if you're looking to build out a team for um, either the Little Bang competition or Big Bang. So that is like number one. Um, we have an event coming up on next Tuesday, November 7th. So Jim Fielding is an author, a, a queer executive, and an inspirational speaker, a storyteller. He has a long history um, with, um, you know, in various corporations, including Disney and Claire's. So he's going to come and he's going to talk about Basically, he'll talk about what his experience was as an executive, but also as an executive who struggled at times to speak his truth and be his best self um, in a in a corporate environment that didn't necessarily match his values or um, his vision or wasn't uh, friendly to uh, diverse perspectives and diverse identities. So this is a fantastic opportunity to meet Jim, um, to hear from a high level executive who will give kind of the insider tips, um, but also just talk about how to navigate some of these more complicated, um, you know, corporate realities. Nikki, do you want to say anything else about this event? I know. I think that was really great. I, um, you know, this one is actually in person, so it's a good opportunity to meet other like-minded students and people from the business community to start building out your network um, early on. So anytime you can attend events like this in person, it really, really helps strengthen those ties to the to the university and to our our larger network. And then, so um, little bang pitch uh, and poster competition as you might know, precedes the Big Bang business competition. And this is a great on-ramp to the Big Bang business competition. So if you're really interested in participating in Big Bang, but you'd like to have the opportunity to get some feedback from um, professional mentors and judges, I highly recommend that you participate in, in Little Bang. So this competition is also a little bit more open. Anybody from high schoolers through PhD students can participate. And um, it essentially is a poster design and um, pitch competition. So you'll come up with your idea, um, develop a poster, and then you'll submit all of your um, materials, your poster and your pitch through Startup Tree and then send your poster to ReproGraphics to get it printed for free. Um, there will be feedback from a judging panel and we'll also have like a public event as you can see in this photograph where you can um, talk about your poster to the public who are invited to attend. So it's a great opportunity to practice your pitch um, and to get feedback in real time from a real variety of people. And then I believe there will be 12 micro grants awarded of uh, up to $1,000. Nikki, anything you want to add to that? No, that's great. Okay. And then 
Um, the registration deadline is January 21st. So you want to register for the competition through Startup Tree. And then your materials, so your poster um, and pitch isn't actually due until January 28th. And Nikki, that's actually just the poster, right? They don't have to submit the pitch along with the poster. Uh, actually, the the February the the January twenty eighth deadline is for both the the poster and and the pitch. Okay. Are those five customer calls? Okay. So you want to upload those materials to Startup Tree on January twenty eighth, and also send the poster to Repro Graphics by January twenty eighth. And then the actual event is February 1st. So that's when you'll get to interact with the public, share your ideas, share your poster and your pitch and um, participate in uh, the judging, which the panel will do. So if you are, um, you know, developing your idea and building out your team and you're still looking for a team member, say you're looking for somebody who is excellent at marketing or um, somebody who could build out the business side of your idea, or you have other real specific asks and you're just looking for somebody with that skill set, I really recommend that you attend a networking and team formation event on November 8th. So that is going to be next week. Um, at, in Gallagher, so I don't think it's the lobby, it's room 212, Ro Gallagher room at Memorial Union. Correct. And then there's, mm -hmm. and then there's going to be one more event January 16th, um, for networking and team formation. If you can't uh, attend the one, uh, next week. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so we have uh, several workshops coming up. The next one is not going to be until January 17th, and all of these workshops kind of build upon one another. So if you're able to attend all of them, fantastic. Um, if you're, you know, I recommend that you attend as many as you can. We have ex different experts teaching each of these workshops. So January's is right to win. And that's going to go a little bit deeper on your executive summary. Um, and then define and validate your business model, identifying your customer and your market, um, projecting and presenting finances, financing, putting your best foot forward and pitching like a pro. And um, I think we mentioned this at the beginning of the workshop, but all of these uh, workshops are recorded and the recordings typically go online on the um, Institute's workshops page within a week of the workshop, along with the slide decks that the speakers shared. But it's always really great to attend in real time if you can, um, because then you get to ask questions of the speakers. So for the Big Bang Business Competition, um, just going over really quickly the different levels of awards. Um, the first place award, whoops, see, it looks like that's obscured for some reason, but it's 25,000, right, Nikki? For, and so that is going to be the number of the first place award in the kind of general category will get $25,000. Um, and then there are sector awards. So we are really lucky. We have some very generous sponsors who um, sponsor each of these different categories. So the top is 25,000. And then the number one um, submission or the winner in each of these different categories will get a $12,500 award. And then yes, Little Bang Pitch and Poster Awards. So it's up to $1,000 for I think 12 winners. And then um, Nikki, it looks like there's a $500 award. Is that a People's Choice Award? Correct. Okay. So really quickly gonna go over the, um, the dates that you wanna look out for going forward. So for, and this is for the Big Bang competition specifically. 
So there is a um, round zero that is not on here, but if you want to have the opportunity to get feedback early on, on your um, executive summary and your team's bios, then you want to submit those by, um, by February 5th for optional feedback. And um, that is, um, I guess that is round one, Nikki, that's going to be round one or round zero. So round one is, is listed there with the due date of February 26th at the bottom. Right. And then we just mentioned the February 5th optional feedback round. Okay. Okay, great. So, so two page executive summary and team member bios. If you submit those by February 5th, you'll get feedback from um, professional reviewers, including um, MBA candidates at the Graduate School of Management. And then you want to also submit those materials by February 26th, because that's the official submission for round one. And then if you're selected to move forward to round two, a two minute video pitch, the 10 slide pitch deck, um, and 20 customer call summaries. And um, the template for those are online. That is due by April 8th. And then um, if you're selected to move forward from there, you'll want to also you'll want to submit a presentation pitch deck, um, which is not going to be quite as detailed as the um, leave behind pitch deck for round two and um, 10 additional customer call summaries by May 6th. And then um, I, this is my email address and my phone number. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions um, about upcoming events or workshops or about the Little Bang or Big Bang competitions. Do you guys, do either any of you have questions right now about anything I've gone over? Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for attending this workshop. We hope to see you in January, January 17th workshop. Um, and I hope that you are excited to participate in one or both of the competitions and um, look forward to hearing from you and, and hopefully staying in touch over the year.